Hi there. It's your internet grandpa here, and I thought we might read Buffalo Girls, Chapter 2. Oh, I didn't get a bookmark in there. Goodness, now I'm going to have to search for it. Remember that song? Buffalo gal, will you come out tonight and dance by the light of the moon? There it is. The wooden wagon seat was hard as rock. Within a mile or two of Rush Springs, my bottom and back were sore. Even my teeth seemed to crunch and grind together with each jarring bounce of the wagon as we plodded over the dry, rutted wagon path that stretched forever across the prairie. We saw some mountains in the distance that were shrouded in haze and seemed almost blue. Them's the Wichita Mountains, the boys called. The boy called Will announced proudly. Oklahoma ain't got many mountains. Them's kind of short, but they's downright pretty, ain't they? I cringed at his words. Though he seemed somewhat bright, the poor grammar, the slang, the way the language slurred and twanged and sort of dripped from his mouth made the boy seem like a total idiot, a complete hick. I wondered if everyone in Oklahoma talked like that. The mountains drew closer, though it seemed to take us forever to get near them. Fort's right over yonder, Will slurred as we rolled from a stand of tall trees along a creek to a wide, flat field. Ought to be there right soon now. In the distance, I could see a group of men in blue uniforms about halfway across the big field. Another man on a horse galloped away from them. As he rode, he leaned down against the horse's neck. Then, sliding to the right, he fired a rifle. Hey, putty tat. Come on up here, say hi to the kids. I shuddered at the terrible sound. I've always hated loud noises. One time when I was little, some balloons popped at Betty Riley's birthday party. I cried for hours. Mother and father took me to the fireworks on the waterfront one fourth of July. Instead of enjoying the festival, I got sick to my stomach and threw up. Then I hid under the carriage. Like I said, I hate loud noises. I hated trains. I hated this trip. I hated this wagon most of all. I hated guns. No sooner had the man fired his gun than he fell from his horse. There was a whoomph sound as he hit the ground and a huge cloud of dust exploded. A loud burst of laughter came from the other men. They practically rolled on the ground, <clears throat> holding their sides and jumping around. A couple of the soldiers even fell to their knees. Beside them, sitting on top of the long-legged gray horse, was another man. He had on no shirt, and in the afternoon sunlight, his skin almost seemed bronze. At first, I thought he must be an Indian, but he was much too tall and slender. From all the pictures I have seen of Indians, I gather that they were short and stocky. He was the only one of the group who wasn't laughing. The soldier who had fallen from his horse stood up and dusted himself off. It ain't funny, he roared at the group. That only made them laugh harder. Rubbing his shoulder, the soldier picked up his rifle and started toward them. Quit laughing, it ain't funny. The tall, dark-skinned man rode up to him. You have to hook with your left leg and hold to the mane with your left hand, he called. Pay attention, I'll show you one last time. With that, he dug his heels into the big gray sides. As the horse raced at a dead out run, the man slipped to the right side of the animal's neck. With his left leg hooked over its back and his left hand holding the mane, he pointed his rifle under the horse's neck. A shot snapped above the sound of thundering hoofbeats. At the base of a hill across the valley from where he stood, from where he rode, stood a row of four posts. One top of each one, on top of each one was a sandbag. A puff of dust exploded from the first when he fired. The same thing happened with the second, third, and fourth. I hated the awful loud sound of the rifle. Still, I was fascinated by the man's skill. I couldn't help but watch. An instant after he fired the last shot, he spun his horse and raced back toward the group of soldiers. Just before he crashed into them, he yanked the reins. His big, big gray horse almost sat down on its haunches as it slid to a stop. Most impressive, Mother whispered. I put my hand under my chin and closed my mouth. Yes, I breathed. 
The man didn't seem to notice the applause and cheers from the men, nor did he pay much attention when they patted him on the back and shoulders as he swung down from his horse and went to get something next to where they stood. He knelt and grabbed a shirt from the ground beside them. He pulled it on. No sooner had it touched his shoulder than he snatched his hat from the ground and stuck it on his head. Then, tucking in the tail of his shirt, he strapped on a pistol belt and holster. Finally, he picked up a saddle and blanket. Not once had I seen him glance toward our wagon, but as he saddled his horse, he pointed. The soldiers looked toward us. They must have thought they'd been alone with no one watching because even as far as we were, I could hear the startled expressions on their faces when the man pointed at us. I could see the startled, boy, where did I get here? <laughs> even as far as we were, I could see the startled expressions on their faces when the man pointed at us. Sometimes I read quicker than I see. <laughs> Quickly, the man swung into his saddle and rode toward us. He did not charge us as he had the soldiers. The gray's nostrils were flared. He was used to running, and he was ready to go again. The man held him in. His horse came, softly. Mrs. Guthridge, he asked as he swung down from the saddle and removed his hat. Will pulled the wagon horse to a stop. He set the brake with his foot. Yes, mother answered. Please forgive me. I was to meet you at the headquarters building. I should have been more presentable. Pardon my appearance. Mother smiled. We are perhaps somewhat early. You have no need to apologize. She raised her eyebrows. You must be Major Lilly. No, ma'am. My name is David. I work for the Major. He's been detained at the telegraph office and has asked me to escort you to headquarters, to the headquarters that Colonel Stewart has provided. He promised that he will join you shortly. The young man smiled and then turned to me. And you must, and this must be your daughter, Amanda. I didn't answer. I only sat there, looking at him. From a distance, because of his great skill with the rifle, I had judged him to be much, much older. Here, as he stood in front of us, I realized he was just about the same age as me. Besides, he was quite handsome. He had a broad, soft smile and the deepest blue eyes. Blue-eyed boys are always prettier than brown-eyed boys, by the way. <laughs> See my lovely blue eyes there? <laughs> so instead of saying, yes, I am a Madden to Guthridge, I sat there, my mouth flopped open like a total idiot, and stared at him. <laughs> that's, that's the response I get from girls all the time, yeah. <laughs> When I didn't answer, his blue eyes turned back to mother. If you would follow me, please. Suddenly, my cheeks felt so hot they almost hurt. As he led the way back through the trees, I could feel the red seeping across my face. I had made such a fool of myself. Why didn't I speak? I could at least have said, yes, I'm Amanda, but all I had done was look at him. Fort Sills was not at all like I expected. Instead of being built of tall logs with guard towers at each corner, the fort was made of stone. It was a low, rambling structure. As we drew closer, I could see small slits built into the rock walls, places which, from which a man could aim a rifle and still be protected by the stone. There was a corral next to the fort, then other buildings in the distance. A little stone church with a steeple stood across the crest of a hill. Beyond it, was a big two-story house. Will pointed to it. Headquarters, he drawled. That's where I got it to bring this here sack of mail and then blankets when we all, when we get y'all stuff unloaded. David led us to a small line of houses and his mother and I tried to stretch the soreness out of our backs. He and Will unloaded our baggage. I should have said something to him. I should have at least smiled instead of just staring with my mouth open. Not only was he tall and handsome, but he was very polite. Although I could still detect a southern drawl and a bit of a twang in his voice, his speech was quite proper and refined. Maybe he hadn't noticed how silly I had acted. If I had only known then what a rude person he was, what a total hick, 
I wouldn't even given him a second thought. My. <laughs> that wasn't very nice to say about him. You're rude and a total hick. <laughs> well, that's the end of chapter two. We'll read chapter three next time. Bye-bye for now. Love you.